Hi, I'm Alex and I'm going to talk about our work on tools to facilitate the development of fully homomorphic encryption applications. This is joint work with Patrick and Alva, both also from ETH Zurich. Fully homomorphic encryption, or FHA, allows a third party to perform arbitrary computations on encrypted data. That means the user can encrypt some values and send them to the cloud, which can then perform computations over the ciphertext without learning the inputs or the computation results. Of course, the client can still encrypt the resulting ciphertext to retrieve the computation result. Effectively, using FHE, we can delegate data processing without having to give away data access. Efficient FHE is a major leap towards a private digital world and enables a wide variety of applications. For example, outsourcing medical data currently requires expensive dedicated setups. Using FHE, one could use cheaper standard cloud services while still protecting the sensitive and highly regulated patient data. FHE can also be used to accelerate common secure computation tasks like private set intersection. Here, FHE is now being deployed in Microsoft's Edge browser. Another example is privacy preserving machine learning as a service, where a platform can offer predictions and classifications of a client's encrypted data without having to share their proprietary model. Here, we see many activities from startups, big players, and governments. Given this and the wide range of applications, why are we only now starting to see FHE appear in real-world deployments? While FHE has been proposed under a slightly different name as far back as 78, it remained an unachievable goal for many decades. While partially homomorphic schemes have been known for decades, progress towards fully homomorphic encryption really only started to accelerate in the 2000s. Even then, it wasn't until the breakthrough resolved by Craig Gentry in 2009 that we had schemes that could support arbitrary computations. Gentry's initial scheme was asymptotically efficient but practically unimplementable. However, follow-up work soon allowed a first implementation. Nevertheless, these first-generation schemes still took around half an hour to perform a single multiplication, a slowdown of over a trillion times compared to a standard CPU multiplication instruction. Second-generation schemes emerge and trade off some theoretical expressiveness for impressive practical performance gain, bringing multiplication times down to seconds rather than minutes. Finally, recent third-generation schemes have brought multiplication times down into the range of a few tens of milliseconds. Today, FHE is practical for a wide set of applications, and performance is no longer the major barrier to adoption. Given this, what are the remaining obstacles on the path to adoption? Going from the complex underlying math behind modern FHE schemes to a practical deployment still requires a significant amount of expertise and poses a wide variety of challenges. While some are common issues of working with crypto, many are unique challenges inherent to FHE. As a result, we see non-experts frequently struggle to develop FHE solutions that are both secure and efficient, with naive approaches often lagging many orders of magnitude behind expert-written state-of-the-art solutions. The FHE community is trying to close this gap by providing tools that assist developers in translating their ideas into FHE applications securely and efficiently. Recently, we've seen a flurry of work in this space which motivated this SOK. We wanted to answer questions about what makes developing FHE applications so hard, compare the design decisions taken in existing tools and how they address some of FHE's complexities, highlight where barriers to entry have already been lowered and where they still remain, and finally outline future directions for FHE tool development. In addition, we want to provide developers with a guide to both the existing tools and more general aspects of FHE development. Ideally, our paper should help non-experts decide how to approach development of FHE applications, including when to use which tool. In order to evaluate the different tools, however, we first need to understand the challenges that they're trying to address. While FHE poses a lot of challenges, we can roughly categorize them into two groups. First, we have cryptographic challenges that are closely related to the specifics of current FHE schemes. For example, selecting parameters that are both secure and efficient for the given application. On the other hand, we have higher level challenges that arise due to the unusual computation model that is inherent in the definition of FHE. These include the lack of branching instructions and the need to exploit clever approximations and optimizations to achieve the full potential of FHE. In terms of tools, libraries tend to focus on the first group, for example, by implementing the various transformations required to efficiently compute multiplications between large ciphertexts. Compilers, meanwhile, generally focus on helping developers deal with the translation between standard imperative programming and FHE's more circuit-based computation model. While we can't explore all challenges in detail today, I want to briefly highlight the crypto side before diving into the computational model of FHE. All current FHE schemes share a common cryptographic structure with security based on a learning with errors assumption. Here, we specifically consider ring LWE, which operates over polynomials, which we will abstract to simple vectors, and for now even just a single vector slot. To encrypt, we take not just a random mask A times the secret key S, 
but also some small noise e, which is essential for security. Adding this up with the message m gives us a freshly encrypted ciphertext. As we go and perform homomorphic operations, the noise increases, linearly when we add two ciphertexts and quadratically when we multiply. Eventually, the noise will grow too large and decryption will fail. To prevent this, an operation known as bootstrapping can homomorphically reduce the noise back down. This, however, comes at significant computational cost. As a result, developers need to constantly balance future noise growth against the cost of bootstrapping. The interaction between computation and noise growth also means that parameters must be carefully chosen per application. Developers must ensure that the parameters chosen are large enough to ensure security and prevent noise overflow. At the same time, parameters should be as small as possible for efficiency. Finding the smallest possible parameters for a given application is non-trivial, and tool-generated parameters tend to be secure but highly inefficient. However, rather than finding the best point in that red triangle, it is frequently more important to optimize the program in a way that limits noise growth and brings down the entire red area. This leads us to the engineering challenges of actually designing and writing a program for FHA. In standard imperative programming, we rely heavily on branching-based control for statements. However, if A and B are encrypted, the security properties guarantee that the server learns nothing about the computation, nor even the single bit required for branching. As we can no longer truly branch, we have to evaluate both branches, compute the condition under encryption, and then multiplex between the two results. We lose the performance benefits of branching by always evaluating both branches, and we actually incur an even more significant overhead here since comparisons aren't polynomial and therefore cannot be expressed easily as operations over integers. Instead of encrypting the ints a and b into one ciphertext each, we now have to encrypt each of their bits individually and use FHG operations mod2 to emulate binary comparison, addition, and multiplication circuits. While a number of compilers assist in doing this translation automatically, the circuits they generate are frequently too naive and therefore inefficient. Loops where the length depends on the secret input obviously run into similar issues. We can apply the multiplexing trick, but we have to evaluate the loop as many times as theoretically possible. The multiplicative depth of this kind of circuit quickly explodes, and therefore many schemes cannot perform any meaningful data-dependent looping in practice. While a few compilers support this kind of loop unrolling, the heavy performance penalty means that it's only really useful when there's a non-trivial upper bound on the loop length. However, all these restrictions of course only apply to loops that depend on a secret input. Other loops can of course be trivially unrolled. For loops like this that apply the same operation to each ciphertext, we can do even better and use a single FHG operation to perform the operations in a single instruction multiple data fashion, or SIMD. Instead of putting the array elements into individual ciphertext, we can reinterpret a single ciphertext as an n-dimensional vector using the Chinese remainder theorem. Combined with homomorphic rotations of the slots, we can apply this technique much more widely, but it becomes highly non-trivial to find the most efficient solution. Quite a few compilers support batching, but generally require the developer to vectorize the algorithm themselves. We're starting to see initial work on automation in this area, however existing solutions are limited to certain domain-specific tasks. As we can see, a lot of challenges remain to be solved. Libraries accelerate fast and efficient implementations of the underlying FHG schemes. However, parameter selection remains an open question. Compilers, meanwhile, provide some assistance with the different computational model, but of course cannot completely insulate developers from these considerations. Later in our evaluation, we will see the significant impact that optimizations, approximations, and the use of SIMD batching have on performance. But first, I want to talk about how compilers actually work. The term compiler is used very loosely in FHE, since many are technically interpreters or libraries. However, they all follow the same pattern of taking a high-level program as an input and spitting out, at least conceptually, an arithmetic circuit ready for FHE evaluation. Therefore, the first choice you have to make is which kind of input language you want to target. Here, I don't mean things like C++ versus Java, but the level of abstraction you want to offer. For example, this is what writing a toy machine learning model looks like in SEAL, an FHG library by Microsoft. We can compare this to an implementation in EVA, a general purpose FHE compiler. Consider the code for the activation function, which we approximate it with a simple polynomial squaring. EVA provides operator overloads and abstracts away the ciphertext maintenance operations, making it significantly more concise and readable. This starts to add up, as we can see from the matrix vector product function. This is the EVA implementation, but the SEAL equivalent has been omitted since it would fill the entire slide. 
while EVA already offers a dramatic improvement in readability, we can go even further when we consider domain-specific tools. Ngraph HE, for example, offers an FHE backend for TensorFlow, and we can use TensorFlow's functional API to specify custom FHE-specific parts. We can go to an even higher level of presentation, with C-Line allowing us to stay in the Keras model description language. This is the most concise program yet, but here we start to lose expressiveness, being limited to predefined model layers and activation functions. More generally, we see a false dichotomy between powerful assembly-style languages and restricted domain-specific languages when there's no inherent reason against having both types of API available in one tool. We also see libraries generally addressing experts and compilers targeting mostly non-experts. However, experts also stand to benefit from tools that automate tedious work and reduce time to solution. Finally, while working with these tools, we noticed a variety of user experience issues around setup and configuration. And we hope that as these tools mature, we see these issues fade into the background. Now that we know what FEG programs look like, we can look at how compilers transform them. There are three stages of transformations and optimizations. First, program optimizations can be static analyses like loop unrolling, which are applied where we still have high-level semantic information. Some compilers instead skip straight to circuit generation, where the program is turned, at least conceptually, into a circuit of gates and wires. This is also where compilers would insert binary emulations for operations like comparisons. Finally, the circuit can be optimized further, for example by trying to find a semantically equivalent circuit that has lower noise growth. Again, not all compilers do this, and instead many simply use the generated circuit without further modification. As we can see, there are many different choices when and what to optimize, and of course different tools have ended up choosing different approaches. We can see that while optimizations in general purpose FHE compilers cover all stages of compilation, each individual tool tends to focus on one specific optimization. Some focus on rewriting the input program using static analysis, and then translate the resulting program into a circuit fairly directly. Others take the input program as is, directly convert it into a circuit, and then start optimizing that circuit. Meanwhile, some substitute in handwritten efficient circuits for binary adders and multipliers, rather than generating naive ones and then optimizing the entire circuit. This is also done by machine learning focused compilers, which take this concept significantly further, since they can provide custom circuit designs for all possible operations their more limited input languages allow. In our evaluation, we wanted to see which of these approaches offers the best performance for common applications. As a first case study application, we consider a modified chi-square test. Specifically, we consider a variant used in genome-wide association studies, which can be rearranged into terms that require only addition and multiplication. We compare a variety of compilers against both a naive baseline and a manually optimized implementation, both written directly against an FHE library. We distinguish between tools emulating binary addition and multiplication circuits and those working directly over the integers, with some tools supporting both modes. We see significant differences even among similar tools, which are due to a variety of reasons, like less efficient underlying FHE implementations or inefficient automatic parameter choices. Only the EVA compiler manages to achieve the same performance as our expert implementation. However, EVA actually targets approximate HE over scalars. While approximate HE with sufficient precision worked great here, this might not be the case for all applications. Of course, if you're working in a specific domain like ML, you have more domain-focused tools to consider too. Our second case study therefore focuses on neural networks for MNIST, a handwritten digit recognition task. We consider both toy MLP models and more realistic convolutional neural networks like the FHE-specific cryptonets or the standard Linet 5 model. All models were trained on plain text data, replacing activation functions with squaring as is common in FHE. This works surprisingly well and we were able to achieve accuracies close to those of unmodified networks. We compared the latency for encrypted inference for the various compilers and models. Despite requiring significant engineering effort, our manual implementation was easily outperformed by NGRAPH AG and EVA. NGRAPH AG is by far the easiest way to work with FHE, while EVA handles even real-world networks like Linet 5 with ease. Learning from these, it seems clear that if you want to see broader adoption of FHE, this must happen through higher level tools like these. We believe that right now is a crucial time to set up future generations of tools for success. We need to automate the remaining challenges of FHE, including parameter selection, but also the translation between the different computation models. 
At the same time, we need to work on the user experience of these tools. We should not have to choose between powerful but complex or easy to use but restricted tools. Instead, we should be able to smoothly transition between abstraction levels as needed. And while current tools are usually standalone, real-world deployments frequently require combining many different components into complex solutions. We need the ability to combine both different FAG tools, but also secure computation tools more generally. Future tools should be able to target and combine a wide variety of techniques depending on the application scenario. Please check out the paper for more details. In addition, our repo contains code, detailed tool descriptions, and ready-to-run Docker images for each of the tools. Thank you for your attention.